We got married relatively late. I was 29 and she was 32. That was six years ago. We were both living life to the fullest before we met, so we were pretty much broke. Premarital discussions included both our desires to have children and our desire for Julie to be a stay-at-home mom until the youngest child went to school. We both agreed that having a full-time parent at home was important for the child's well-being, if it could be afforded. This meant that until we had children, we had to save enough money to get through bad harvest years. That meant Julie working full-time and me doing the same with as much overtime as I could eat. I was used to working double shifts on Fridays, getting off work late on Saturday and working another 12 hours. That was paying off, too. We now owned the house outright and the bank account was steadily growing. Recent discussions have led me to believe that children would be in the plans very soon. Of course, even before Julie reached 40, so that the chances of conceiving our first child didn't go down. That's why our conversation Thursday night was so strange. Dave, I want to discuss a trial separation. How do you spell distrustful? I was shocked to the point where my brain froze. All I could say was, what? Those of you who have ever been dumped by a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, know the feeling. The person who gets dumped has it all planned out and is fully prepared. The person being dumped is unprepared and confused. That was me right at that moment. My next statement was, therefore, equally intellectually stimulating. Why? I just think we need a little break from each other. You have to admit, Dave, that you're not as romantic as you used to be, and you don't seem to appreciate me as much. You always say you're too tired to go out more than once a month. You don't make love to me four times a week like you used to, and frankly, you're putting on a little weight. Surely you'd agree that a little break would be good for us. How about a month, Dave? Then we'll see how we're doing. I'll stay at Frida's. Feel free to call me whenever you want, but I don't think we should see each other more than once a week. More than that, and it wouldn't be much of a separation, would it? Just be assured, Dave, that I love you very much, and I know we'll make beautiful children together. I'm sure that in a month, two at most, we'll be back where we were before. With those words, Julia stood up, picked up her two suitcases, and headed for the door. I don't have any say in this, Julie, I stammered. I've made my decision, Dave. Please sit down, Julie, she reluctantly returned. Who is he, Julie? God, I knew you'd think that. I just told you I love you, Dave, just you. There's no one else. So there's no need to tap my phones, spy on me, put a GPS tracker in my car, or hire a private investigator. In fact, if you do any of those things, I might interpret it as a distrust of me and a reason to reevaluate our relationship. She tried to stand up again, but I grabbed her arm and pulled her down. It's not fair, Julie. You've had days or weeks to plan your little speech and your little gamble, but this is all new to me. What's the gamble, Dave? I was glad that her face finally reflected the embarrassment I'd been feeling. You realize, of course, that you've just jeopardized our relationship, Julia, with your one-sided antics. She reeks of contempt. I've always treated you as an equal partner in our relationship and would never think of doing something so risky without asking your opinion. What risk, Dave? I love you. You love me. What's the big deal? It's only for a month or so. If I miss you before then, I'll be back like a shot. What do you mean by contempt? I mean you haven't given me a chance to defend myself. For example, we hardly ever go out together because I work overtime on Fridays and Saturdays. We agreed on overtime to improve our financial situation. We don't make love as often as we used to, partly because we've been married for six years and partly because I'm always so wound up. I put on weight because you offered me a supervisor position for extra money, which isn't a practical job. It's exactly what I've been thinking about lately. So can you please stay so we can discuss it? I'm sorry, Dave. I promised Frida I'd go out with her tonight. With those words, she got up, grabbed her bags, and headed for the door. All I could say was, just remember you're married, Julie. With only a brief pause, she headed for the door. The next day, I returned to work at 10 a.m. with sandwiches made from a week's worth of bread. In the evening, I went to the 24-hour corner store for some supplies. When I got home after 11.30 p.m., the message light on my phone was flashing. It was Julie saying she missed me and thanked me for giving her some time without calling. I was starting to get annoyed that I was busting my ass to put three times as much money in the bank as she was while she was having a social life. Funny, 
I'd never taken offense before. Neither of us called each other on Sunday. On Monday, I went to my boss and told him I was sorry I wouldn't be able to work overtime for a while. When I didn't contact Julie until Wednesday, she called me. I felt a little guilty for cold calling her, so I went to Frida's house after dinner on Thursday. I took a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates as a peace offering. Frida was Julie's best friend. She had been divorced for a little over a year. I never knew exactly why, but I suspect it was because she may have cheated on her husband. She explained that Julie was in the shower. I waited on the couch and Frida sat next to me. She came much closer than I was comfortable with. I quietly shuffled away, but she followed me. Thank goodness Julie came down at that moment. I gave her flowers and chocolates. Our conversation was somewhat strained. Nothing like the usual easy conversation. After some small talk, she asked, Did you want something, Dave? I have to admit I was a little puzzled by this. No, I just came by to ask my wife out tomorrow night. Sorry, Frida and I already made some plans. Wait, tomorrow's Friday. You work Friday nights. No, I quit. What about the money? Well, I've decided to prioritize my family and my physical health. When I got your text at 11.30 last Saturday night, the same one where you said you were going out, I decided I was being a complete idiot working myself to death. Last Friday, I was so tired I almost died at work. Julia looked shocked. She came over and gave me a hug. No offense, dear. I'm going to need your little sperm in a few months. At that moment, Frida came back and spoiled the mood. Sorry, Dave, but the girls are coming to a party at the Tupperware soon. I rushed out. There are some things a person is not meant to see. Julie walked me out. I had to say, please come home, Julie. I miss you. Three more weeks, Dave and then we'll talk. I noticed that she looked very uncomfortable when she said this, as if she hated saying no. However, any renewed good feelings disappeared when she added, why don't you take a month off from overtime to recuperate? We're going to need that money, Dave. I just looked at the flowers and candy still lying where she had carelessly tossed them and walked away. My weekly visit was Tuesday night the following week. Julia was showering again. I didn't make the same mistake as last time and sat down on the couch. Frida was dressed and standing very close as she spoke. It really made me feel uncomfortable. Julia came downstairs also dressed. She looked a little embarrassed as she explained that I really should have called. If I had, I would have known they were leaving. I felt more than humiliated at being kicked out. I could have sworn I heard giggling from the other side of the door. I swore that was the last time I would humiliate myself. For the rest of the week, neither of us called. That Sunday, I practiced in the backyard. I had put together some homemade weight equipment and already felt like I was getting closer to my former strength. Suddenly, I felt someone's arms around me from behind and someone's body pressed against my sweaty back. I was enjoying my first human body contact in two weeks. Suddenly, I froze when Frida's voice sounded right next to my ear. Sorry, handsome. I just couldn't resist. Shocked, I turned around simultaneously disentangling myself. More to hide my embarrassment than to be friendly, I asked her if she wanted coffee. I noticed that Frida was dressed in one of her usual slutty outfits. I have to admit, however, that it did show off some pretty impressive cleavage. Once inside, I sat down on the edge of the kitchen table. That didn't work. Frida pulled a chair closer to me, so close that our feet touched. We chatted about nothing which had never been my strong suit. Aren't you gonna ask how Julie's doing? No. She's made it clear that it's none of my business. Frida smiled. You know, she's a little upset. She was hoping you'd be begging and groveling by now. I'm sorry, Frida, but that's not my style. I asked her out when I first came to see you. She turned me down, saying she already had plans. I noticed she never called or asked to reschedule. I have no idea what this separation is, so I'm just going to sit and wait for her to come back or for our marriage to end. I thought everything I said would be relayed to Julia. I expected Frida to be alarmed when she heard my last statement, but she only smiled and put her hand on my leg. It must be some kind of test. I knew it would pass since I didn't find Frida emotionally attractive. But the body was another matter entirely. I noticed that another button of her top had magically come undone. You know I've always admired you and Julie as a couple, don't you? Do you have to be really sure of your love to let her date other guys, or are you just pretending not to care? My blood ran cold. We hadn't talked about dating during this one-sided breakup, but my statement, don't forget you're married, should have gone without saying. 
Without a word, I walked out of the house and got into my car. Upon reaching Frida's house, I barged right in. From the kitchen window, I could see Julie in a bikini sunbathing on the terrace. I staggered determinedly toward the exit. Julie, what is this crap Frida's been telling me about your dating? I wasn't dating Dave. We met a couple of guys last Tuesday at a club and did a little dancing. We may have mentioned that we might be there to meet them again, but it's hardly a date. I expected Julie to look concerned, defending herself in this way, but she didn't. If I had to pick a word to describe how she looked, it would be determined. What happened last night, dear? Uh, nothing. Just more dancing. Nothing inappropriate. We didn't kiss or anything. They just bought us a drink and we danced a little. Nothing inappropriate. Since when is it appropriate for a married woman to dance with other men when her husband isn't even around? I suppose at the end of the evening you just casually mentioned to them the next time you were there. Well, if you meet them again, it will definitely be a date and just as definitely be very inappropriate. Look, Julie, this whole thing is really hurting me, you know? I still have no idea what this separation is. Why don't we skip the next two weeks and you come home right now? I really miss you. No, Dave, not yet. In fact, I think we'll be back in a month. My old feelings for you haven't returned yet. She looked strangely confused again, like she was saying something she didn't really mean. Of all her irrational behaviors lately, this was the one that confused me the most. I just stared at her for another moment, then got up to leave. You could ask me out on another date, you know. You might get lucky this time. Without stopping or looking back, I quit. Or you could ask me out on a date. You know where I live. Starting Monday, Julie started calling home every night. The conversations were always short and awkward. I got the impression she was just checking to see if I was home. I didn't like that. Friday night, she called at 7 o'clock in the evening. Forwarding the home phone to my cell phone as I had programmed worked like a spell. I could clearly hear music in the background. I almost made it to Frida's house and made sure Julie's car was gone. Ten minutes away from Frida's, I saw Julie's car in the parking lot of one of the bars. I peered out the window of the bar until I saw Julie and Frida sitting alone in a booth. As I watched, two more girls joined them. In one, I vaguely recognized another of Julie's friends, Deborah. The other was unfamiliar. I watched as Deborah introduced her to Julie and Frida. While they were distracted, I crept to the far corner and hid at the far end of the bar. With an effort, I caught most of what was being said. Deborah was saying, You're crazy, Julie. From what you said, Dave is much more romantic than my husband. Another voice, presumably belonging to a stranger, interjected. Yeah, I think so too. I'd kill for half of what you say you're getting from your ex. Frida intervened. Don't you think Julie deserves better? I mean, look at her. She's beautiful. Deborah said. I don't know, but it sounds like a very dangerous game. How do you feel about him, Julie? It sounds like working so much overtime, the guy must be wasting most of his time. You keep him in bed all Sunday and fuck his ass? Hell, if he was mine, that's what I'd be doing. Julie spoke softly, so I didn't hear a word of her response, which went on for several minutes. All I heard when Julie finished was Deborah starting up again. And you're making this guy fight for you. At that moment, someone turned on the jukebox. The bar was filling up fast. I wondered how long it would be before these guys showed up. For the next hour, I watched a multitude of guys approach the girls, trying their luck. They all walked away, disappointed. Then I noticed that stranger heading towards the bar. As she approached my corner, I made room for her. She smiled at me and ordered four drinks. Up close, she appeared to be quite an attractive lady, short brown curly hair, and an easy smile. While she waited for her drink, she turned to me. Do you come here often? Hey, that should be my question. Well, you've been too slow. We chatted casually until her drinks arrived. I didn't miss her probing look at my ring finger. Because of my job, I almost never wear a ring. She surprised me. Look, the conversation at my desk is fucking awful. Do you mind if I use you as an excuse to leave them? What? How could I mind a beautiful girl talking to me? What do you think? But I must warn you, I'm married, but my marriage is in dire straits. That's why I'm here. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for your honesty. I'm just looking for some company, so if it's okay, I'd like to chat. She gave me a mischievous smile and was back in two minutes. For the next hour and a half, we chatted casually. I kept looking around to make sure we weren't being watched. I noticed that a man had taken an empty seat at the girls' table and was buying all the drinks. Sarah was a delightful girl, and we had a great time together. At 11.30, Deborah came over. 
I didn't see her until it was too late to hide. There was a look of vague bewilderment on her face. I knew the feeling. She knew she had seen me before, but couldn't remember where. I smiled as Sarah introduced us to each other. She whispered something in Sarah's ear that I was almost certain of. You're right, he is cute. Julie offered us a ride home. You need a ride. I noticed the indecision on Sarah's face. I really have to go anyway. It was nice talking to you, Sarah. I kissed her on the cheek. She blushed and walked away. Halfway to the door, she came back and handed me a business card. Without saying a word, but smiling again, she left. I watched as all three girls walked out, leaving Frida and the guy at the table. I decided to give them a five-minute head start in the parking lot. Two minutes later, my cell phone rang. The caller ID showed it was Julie calling on the forwarded home phone. After greetings, she asked why there was music playing in the background. Are we having a party at the house? I'm at the bar, Julie. I spent the evening chatting up a beautiful girl. What the fuck, Dave? Who said you could do that? Are you saying you're the only one free tonight? Are you saying I'm not free? Of course you are. As long as we're married, I expect you to behave accordingly. Didn't you call me from the bar? Uh, yeah. And I guess those guys from last time didn't show up, did they? No, yeah, maybe. Look, Dave, I told you I'm not dating. It was nice to see her confused. Look, Julie, why don't we cut the crap and go back to the way things were before? Come home, I'll meet you there. Then there was a pause. No, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm just not ready. Okay, well then, come over for the night. No, sorry, Dave, I'll call you later. I went back to thinking about what everything I'd learned that evening meant. Without having a clear idea, I had the impression that the situation was getting out of hand. This time, Frida came in on Saturday afternoon. I asked her what the hell her friend was playing at, but she denied it. But not very convincingly. This time, when she tried to kiss me, I was ready. I held her at arm's length. What the hell are you playing at, Frida? I'm married to your best friend, for God's sake. That's for now, Dave. I just wanted to see if I had a chance after Julie left you. It sounded so contrived it was funny, but it reinforced my first suspicion. You mean if Julie leaves me, Frida? Of course, Dave. I really hope you're up to it. Telling her that I felt very uncomfortable with the situation, I escorted her out the door. Frida didn't want to leave. In the end, I had to be blunt and tell her how inappropriate her behavior was. Are you and Julie going out again tonight? Yeah, I guess so. That was our goodbye conversation. I called Sarah. She seemed happy to get my call, but said she couldn't make it tonight. She suggested Tuesday. I felt it was my duty to remind her. Look, Sarah, we'll just be friends. I'm still in the middle of a very confusing personal situation at the moment. I just really enjoyed your company last night. I promise to treat you with the utmost respect until everything is sorted out. After saying that she enjoyed our conversation and her situation was also a little complicated, she hung up, saying she was looking forward to Tuesday. Monday morning marked the beginning of a new relationship pattern with Julia. She started calling me at 6 a.m. every weekday, around 6 p.m. when I usually got home from work and again before bed, allegedly because she missed me, but my pleas for her to return were rebuffed. It was pretty clear that I was being tested. On Tuesday, Sarah met me at the front door of her apartment and we left immediately. She looked gorgeous. As soon as we were seated in the restaurant, I started the conversation. So, do you want to tell me why your personal life is a little messed up? Yeah, her name is Hannah. Turns out Hannah was Sarah's three-year-old daughter. Her father decided that family life was too serious. Sarah's mom was watching her today. In an effort to distract her from asking about my personal problems, I changed the subject. When we were talking at the bar, you said the conversation at your table was pretty damn awful. What was that all about? Oh, that. Terrible conversations and stupid people. There was a woman named Julie. She had just temporarily separated from her husband. But the stupid woman was determined to get back together with him. They were just about to have kids, and she had broken up with him to try to get him to fight for her, you know. Pamper her more. Be more romantic and such. The sad thing, though, was that when she described what he was doing, he was already doing quite a bit. He brought her flowers every week, went on dates every month, and seemed to always spoil her. Even though he works late every Saturday, on Sundays, he would get up early and make her breakfast. Last year, he even took her on a surprise cruise. Gosh, I would have been happy to get half of that from my ex. 
It made my friend Deb sad, too. She doesn't get anything like that. Some girls just don't realize how good they have it, I guess. Trust me, it gets even sillier. Even before they broke up, she was doing everything she could to make him jealous. Like what? Well, apparently she'd come home from girls' nights out later and later, deliberately wearing men's cologne. Heck, one time she even got a pair of panties from her friend Frida. The latter had only been from her lover, so you can imagine what they were like. She put them on the bedroom floor until the next day. Her husband didn't notice a thing. I think her husband is pretty naive. Or he just loved her so much that he never saw these things. When none of this worked, she and her friend came up with a trial divorce. The idea is that he was supposed to get desperate and fight like hell for her. But the guy does nothing. When he didn't react the way he should have, they decided to escalate things. She stopped calling him. He ignored her. Then she got her friend to put it into his head that she was dating. After all they've done, the poor guy just doesn't respond. To tell you the truth, I admire him. It's exactly what I would do if someone treated me like that. But what was really sad was when Deb asked how much effort she on her part had put into this marriage. I think at that moment Julie realized how one-sided her relationship had been. You'd think that would motivate her to stop all the nonsense, but it didn't. Now they've really backed themselves into a corner. They're stuck and have no idea what to do. All because a proud person doesn't play by their rules. Well, she could go back to him, spill everything, and get back to normal. Yes, that's what I would do, and I think that's what she really wants to do. Besides, I think her friend is spinning it. Frida gave her a couple of very vague looks on Friday. Maybe the friend is trying to drive a wedge between them to steal a husband for herself. You know, maybe you're right. That would certainly be consistent with what I saw, although it would probably make her a cold, mean bitch. If you were that husband, what would you do? Well. I don't know how their relationship has worked out so far, but my reflex is to dump the stupid, crazy bitch, move on to someone who will actually appreciate him. At that point, the food arrived, and we moved on to more neutral topics. I couldn't believe how comfortable I felt with Sarah. When the waitress removed the empty glasses, my conscience wouldn't let me continue this farce. You know, Sarah, everything you said gave me the impression that you're a very decent person with very healthy values. Well, thank you, kind sir. Do you consider me a decent person? Without hesitation, Sarah replied, I pride myself on being a good judge of character, and I'm willing to bet money that you are a very good man. Oh boy, this isn't going to be easy. I reached across the table and grabbed her arms, probably in an attempt to stop her running away. Taking a deep breath, I dove right in. Please forgive me, Sarah, but I was a bit of a liar. My excuse is that I'm really confused at the moment and would do anything to alleviate the confusion I'm feeling. I want you to know that I really respect you, so I will tell the whole truth. Let me introduce myself properly. My name is Dave, and I've been married to a girl named Julie for six years. Four weeks ago, she announced, despite my objections, that she wanted a trial divorce. Tonight, a new friend advised me to dump the bitch. Because of the extreme disrespect she's shown me, plus the horrible pain she's caused, I was already thinking along the same lines. You were right. I had treated her like a queen but only now did I realize how little she had given in return. I watched the cavalcade of emotions on Sarah's face before I stopped at horror. She clamped her mouth shut with a clenched fist. Oh my God, did I call your wife a stupid bitch? Well, she is such a stupid bitch. Do you realize that the first words you said weren't about how I insulted you with lies, but how you could insult me? It just confirms what a wonderful person you are. Can you forgive me? Yes. You use me a little, but I can see why. Is that why you talked to me Friday night? You were looking for a spy? Hey, you were talking to me, remember? Can I count on your friendship until this case is resolved one way or another? Sure, Dave. But friendship is all I can offer. I want nothing to do with killing your marriage. Thank you. Your friendship is all I need right now. From my perspective, we had a perfectly happy marriage without the slightest hint of Julia being unhappy. One Thursday, I came home from work and she gave me a trial separation. She was about to leave, but I made her give me some sort of explanation. But not so much that I stopped being really confused. Since I put all my energy into my work or Julie, I don't really have any close friends. Is there any chance that you can fix this? 
I don't know, Sarah. A big part of me thinks I'd feel like a total wuss taking her back after the way she treated me. Besides, after talking to you, I realize how one-sided my marriage was. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this. By mutual tacit agreement, we moved on to more neutral topics. We had a lovely evening, which ended when Sarah wanted to change mothers. I suggested that she think it over and contact me. I said I would understand if I never heard from her again. The next day I was walking to the grocery store when I was accosted from a coffee shop a little further down the street. I turned around and saw Julie, Frida, and another girl standing with her back to me. As I approached the table, my heart dropped when I recognized Deborah. She gave the game away by exploding, you, when she recognized me. The expected phone call didn't come until 9.30 p.m. I was almost asleep and no one feels better in that state. Dave, didn't I warn you not to spy on me? The fact that you did just shows me your distrust of me. Not only that, it shows an extreme lack of respect. Look at it from my point of view, Julie. You pull this stunt on me and you refuse to tell me what it means. Don't you think I could try to find out for myself? It was a clear violation of our rules, Dave. Your rules, Julie. Dave, darling, I just don't know what to make of all this. This trial separation just isn't working out the way I thought it would. I'm not sure I love you as much as I need to. I think we should extend it another month or two, see what happens. She paused, clearly expecting me to explode. I remained silent. Unless she'd changed her mind since last Friday, this was just an escalation to make me try harder. What's the old saying? If at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. Personally, I preferred the mining version of this variation. If at first you don't succeed, try more explosives next time. Just prolonging the separation and confirming her lowered opinion of me was pretty lame, I thought. Of course, there was more to it than that. Okay, Dave, I didn't want to do this, but I think it's only fair. I think I can go out with other guys. Maybe if I do that, I'll realize how good you are and get my old feelings back. She paused again, waiting for the inevitable explosion. This time, my silence wasn't intentional. I was simply at a loss for words. When I was able to speak, I chose to remain silent. I knew I couldn't control what I would say, but I knew it was unlikely to solve any problems. Are you here, Dave? I still didn't answer. I considered for a moment whether to tell her that I knew exactly what she was up to. If I laid all my cards on the table, she'd probably come back, but the underlying problem would remain. Dave? I think your date would be a very bad move, Julie. In fact, let me make this clear. If you actually date or in any way behave inappropriately as a married woman, then I will consider you to have given up on our marriage. By inappropriate, I mean meeting a guy more than once, dancing, touching, or kissing another guy. Am I making myself clear? I really don't know if we can save the marriage even if you come back tonight, but I'm willing to try. Please go back to where you belong, Julie. This time, the silence was hers. Well, I don't think you're in a position to dictate terms, Dave. You don't own me. I think I'm free to find some of the romance and companionship I've missed over the last month. At this point, I was seriously starting to think Julie had lost her mind. Do I have to point out that the reason she missed romance was because she was running away from romance? So, Julie, you insist on opening this marriage? Look, You've never given me a reason for this separation that I could understand. The closest theory I could think of was that you're trying to get me to work harder, to put more effort into our marriage. I brush that off as too disrespectful. One of the benefits of you leaving is that I have time to think. I realize now that I think I put a lot more effort into our relationship than you did. And there was silence again. When she interrupted him this time, it was in a voice that was one step away from sobbing. It was as if she was slavishly following a plan that she suddenly realized was seriously flawed. I'm sorry, Dave, but I've already made up my mind. The buzzer heralded the end of the conversation, and I suspected that it was also about our marriage. Sarah called Thursday night. She told me I was completely forgiven. I was more relieved than I can describe. She asked about the news, assuring me that she was only asking as a friend. I described my recent conversations with Julia adding my analysis or her likely motive. What are you going to do now, Dave? Just sit around and wait for her to bungle our marriage, I guess. You want me to spy on her this weekend, Dave? No, don't get dirty with that, Sarah. 
How about you find out where they are and ask me out to the same place? No, I'm not going to stoop to her level. But it's a good idea. I'd like to see you this weekend. We negotiated for a few minutes without much difficulty and finally decided to have a Sunday picnic. She didn't press me on why I wasn't free on Friday or Saturday. She knew. We must have talked for maybe two hours. It didn't take long to find Julie and Frida on Friday. The fact that they were sitting in the same old bar suggested to me that one of two possibilities was in play. Either Julie really was convinced that I was too scared to spy on her, or, more likely, she was relying on me spying on her. This time I watched the whole thing through the windows, slightly ashamed of my actions. Julia was on her best behavior that evening. It was just her, Frida and Deborah. They just chatted until 10 p.m. Frida accepted several offers to dance, but the other two declined. Eventually, two persistent guys approached them, clearly targeting Julie and Frida. Soon, Deborah left, leaving the foursome sitting at the table. All the while, the girls furtively looked around the dark corners of the bar. I was pleasantly surprised when Frida and Julie left alone at 11.30. I followed the cab to their house and stood watching until the lights went out. Saturday was a different story. Once again, it was the same bar. This time, the same two guys were waiting and immediately hooked up. At 8.05 p.m., my marriage was over. After Frida came out from behind the table to dance with her chosen half of the dynamic duo, the other guy made his move. He moved closer to Julie, and from my vantage point, I saw him put his hand on her leg. In the five minutes I gave her to get him off, she must have looked around the bar at least six times. I walked into the bar. When she saw me approaching, she at least had the decency to push the guy's arm away. The look on her face could only be described as smug as she uttered her first gambit. Dave, I warned you not to spy on me again. Her unfortunate victim, sensing my mood, stood up. Confront me or run, I'll never know. Ignoring all socially acceptable behavior, I stepped very close to it, emphasizing its diminutive size next to my 6'1". With a low growl, I uttered the shortest phrase in the English language. Get away, he ran. Keeping my eyes on Julie's face, I sat down in the seat I had vacated and pulled a bundle of papers from my breast pocket. These are the papers for a mutually agreed divorce. I've already filled them out. All you have to do is sign them. I've included a separate agreement to divide our assets. I see no reason not to split everything 50-50. It makes sense if I keep the house, since you've already moved out. I watched as the smug expression on her face changed to one closer to horror. I didn't wait for the show to end. I desperately wished Julie hadn't seen my watery eyes. She didn't utter a word as I ran away. Intrigued, I started looking out the window again. Julie was crying to the point of tears. Two minutes later, Frida returned confused. As soon as she looked at the papers on the table, her face broke into a wide smile. For the next hour, I watched Frida do most of the talking. After 15 minutes, Julia stopped crying. An hour later, she looked completely relaxed. She seemed to have somehow managed to convince Julia that their plot was going according to plan. I didn't sleep well again that night. I knew the final confrontation was yet to come. More pain for a woman I just couldn't take my mind off of. I anticipated Frida's visit the next day and pretended I wasn't home when she arrived. I ignored several of her phone calls. There was nothing from Julie. At 1.30 p.m., I knocked on Sarah's door. She took one look at the bouquet of red roses in my hand and hugged me tightly. I was going to ask how you spent the last few days, but now I see. God, this woman was perceptive. She knew that friends don't give each other roses or that I would give them to her when it was half over. She invited me in and we approached the elderly lady. Putting her arm around me, Sarah introduced us to each other. Dave, this is my mom, Laura. Mom, this is my boyfriend, Dave. I was at a loss for words, but this time in a good way. I was also wondering how much Sarah had told her mother. Laura solved that problem for me by asking. So, is it over? I informed them of the recent events. Added my assumption that Julia hadn't taken it seriously. It took some more work to prove I was serious. By breaking the rules, she showed how much she disrespected me. They both saw and heard my pain. Laura hugged me too. Then a little angel came into the room. Hannah had already finished her nap. I was introduced again. She looked disappointed when Sarah explained that Sarah and I were going out, even after Laura explained how much fun she and Hannah would have. Can't she come with us? I whispered to Sarah. Are you sure? I'm taking everything in a bag. 
That would be great. I'm torn about being away from her for a whole week, so I love spending the whole weekend with her. Hannah brightened up when she was told the news. We had a great day by the river. Sarah complained that she felt a little left out, but I knew from her wide smile that I shouldn't take that too seriously. I got both ladies home, where Laura treated me to dinner. I left with another chaste kiss on Sarah's cheek. When I got home, Julie must have been hiding in her hiding place a little farther down the road. I didn't even have time to open the front door when she pulled into the driveway. She left the engine running and got out. In her hands, she held the papers I had given her on Saturday. Here you go, Dave. Signed and witnessed. Good night. I was stunned when she walked back to her car. She jumped back in and buckled up. Putting the car in reverse, she rolled down her window and called out to me. Now that I've figured out your little bluff, maybe you'll ask me out this week. I'm free on Wednesday. With those words, she walked away. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. I'm from Earth and Julie seems to be from somewhere in the Horsehead Nebula. If it was over screaming, it would be some kind of creepy screaming. The screaming started on Monday night. Frida was waiting for me in the driveway when I got home from work. Before I could react, she grabbed me and kissed me on the lips as I got out of the car. I roughly pushed her away, yelling, Listen, once and for all, I'm not the least bit interested in you, Frida. Any response she made was intercepted by the roar of the engine, accompanied by the squeal of tires as Julie sprang from her hiding place. Frida noticed her approach and tried to run down the driveway as Julie drove down it. She almost succeeded. No sooner had the car stopped than Julie swung the door open, knocking Frida over. Frida jumped to her feet, but was knocked down by a blow to the head that had an awful lot of rage in it. This time Frida was in no hurry to get up. Now, under normal circumstances, staying down was a good move, coming face to face with an enraged tigress who suddenly realized she had been taken for a fool. Julie started kicking her legs. Julie's rage was simply unbearable. Finally, when Julie was tired but still foaming at the mouth, I took the risk of throwing her to the ground. At that very moment, a police car drove by. Julie and I were handcuffed and an ambulance was called for Frida. The police questioned Julie first. From my cell, I could hear her screaming. Eventually, they gave up and took her to cool off in the cell across from me. When it was my turn, I told them the whole story. I tried to convince them that Julie's actions were justified. I felt I owed it to her. I was released with an apology at 11 p.m. I went to work on Monday. On the way home, I contacted Sarah on the phone. She invited me over for dinner again and relayed Hannah's request. Could that sweet Dave read me a bedtime story tonight? I arrived home an hour later than usual. I was working with Freda's father and stopped by his house to talk to him and his wife. I told everything I knew about their daughter's manipulation of my wife. Neither of them seemed particularly surprised. I convinced them to try to convince Freda not to press assault charges against Julia. They promised to do their best. When I finally arrived home, Julie's car was parked in the garage. As I entered the master bedroom, I saw her empty suitcases on the bed. The shower was on. I called Sarah and canceled our dinner. We discussed what tactics Julie would take. In retrospect, we were both wrong. Julie came down the stairs, full of her usual confidence. What are we having for dinner, Dave? I didn't answer, so she walked over and stood right in front of my chair. I've decided to forgive you, Dave. We've both behaved a little foolishly, I know, but let's put it all behind us. I'm back. When I regained my speech, I couldn't help but blurt it out. Can you tell me exactly how I acted a little silly, Julia, and what I did to make you forgive me? Well, for the pain you caused me with your stupid divorce, Dave, that was very low of you. Luckily, I knew you were bluffing the whole time. What makes you think it was a bluff, Julie? That's what Frida said. Whatever illusions Julie had maintained up to this point seemed to have simply evaporated. She was so deeply under Frida's spell that some remnants still clung to her, until now. Her face went pale, and she slumped onto the coffee table with a thud as the new reality worked its way into her mind. The performance lasted five or six minutes. Finally. We're breaking up, aren't we? You weren't bluffing on the divorce, were you? I was so sure of it, I just signed it. I shook my head sadly from side to side. For the record, Julie. We're not breaking up. You blew me off. I've always done everything I could think of or have the energy to do for you. What did I get? You just walked away, leaving me lost and alone. 
I tried to warn you. Didn't I say it was a gamble? How much more straightforward could I have been? After all the love and effort I put in, I expected, no, I knew I deserved at least respect and loyalty. Had I gotten them? No, I got kicked in the teeth, disrespected, broken, and confused. Did you ever look at the balance of effort in our marriage and see the lopsided result I've seen over the last five weeks? No, you just let some manipulative bitch convince you that you can get more. Well, now you can't have Frida. I got her. Where the hell did that come from? Look, this has nothing to do with Frida. Of course, at some point I realized it was all just a scam on her part to drive a wedge between us, but I never thought of her as anything other than the whore she is. So we're all right then, aren't we, Dave? That's it. That was the most important thing, the point of no return. No, we're not fine, Julie. We have signed divorce papers. I can't get over the disrespect you've shown me this whole time. Not to mention the threats. I have to tell you, when you threw me out, I was picked up. Surprisingly, Julia's face turned even paler. What do you mean, Dave? I met someone else, Julie. She started out as just a friend who helped me through it. God knows I needed it. You left me. I'm sorry, Julie, but you took a gamble and you lost. With a clear conscience, I walked out into a new life.